Hey, folks, welcome to No Stop Likes with Ken Ard. Ken, we're doing something a little different today. Yeah, I, 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 I don't have any idea what we're doing. I mean, somebody <laughs> told me to show. No, I'm kidding. There, there, there were some of you out there um, that, that, that matter a lot to me that said, hey, man, you're always asking the questions. You're, you're always pushing the envelope. You're always talking about the issues that that important to you. We think it would be interesting if somebody asked you some questions, if somebody tried to get under under your hood, understand what you thought, where you come from, what you're about. My, my, my life has been kind of an open book. The older I get, the more liberated I become. Ain't a lot of secrets uh, between you and I, most of our viewers and and listeners. So, uh, so Rodney's agreed. Rodney's a good friend of mine. Uh, Rodney and I have developed. I've, I've always known of Rodney, and I think he's always known of me. But Rodney and I have developed a a very sincere friendship, and we're kindred spirits. We love football. Uh, we ain't real smart. Uh, we, we believe we have to make up for some of that aptitude deficiency by working real hard. But I reached out to Rodney earlier this week, said, hey, man, some of these folks would like us to do a podcast in reverse. Would you be willing to play host? And he said, of course I would. Absolutely, I would. Be a lot of fun. Before I go back to Rodney, I do want to do the most important thing we could possibly do on No Stop Lights, and that is thank our, our sponsors, Francis Marion University, Carolina Bank, Mickey Finns, Victor's, Marlboro PD Electric Co-op, McCall Farms, Pepsi of Florence, PLC Commercial Real Estate, and McLeod Health. If it weren't for these people and these companies and corporations being as community-minded as they are, because I'm not sure these companies gain a lot financially by being a part of this, but they love the community. They believe I love the community. They want to be a part of making this community better. So sincerely, 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 I thank these sponsors for their willingness to uh, kind of underwrite some of the expense it takes to, um, you know, to, to pay this very average talent and and, uh, and the cameras and then, you know, the, the apparatuses around us. So, so Rodney, I want to begin by thanking you, and, and I mean that sincerely for agreeing to do this. I'm thanking you on the front end. I ain't sure what you got written down. Um, I, I, w w we'll make a determination la later whether I thank you um, after the fact. But thank you, and I mean that sincerely for agreeing to do this. Absolutely, Ken. I so embraced the phone call uh, once you called about this whole concept. You know, you and I, uh, for years now, have talked about characters and the lack of today. It seems like our characters in our world are diminishing. And so I thought, what a great opportunity. I've been in long pursuit of of characters all my life. And my friend, whether you know it or not, you're one of them. So I thought this was a great opportunity to maybe take a deep dive in your life, talk about some of the past histories. And here's what I want to learn today. Okay. Uh, are characters, are, are they born? Are they made through environment? Or both? And I think through a series of questions here asked to you, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to learn a little bit about that. So let's take a, a deep dive into your life. And let me open with this, though, and, and, and you'll, you'll relate this. I might even told you the story. Years ago, it would have been when you were lieutenant governor, and I was mayor. We had Ric Flair to come to town. I was chairman of the uh, uh, chamber of, uh, no, it was United Way at the time, and he was our, our marquee speaker. And we paid a lot of money for Ric Flair to come. I spent the entire day with him. And as we would go from school to school and privately in that car, it was just like you and I talk. You know, we have lunch quite often, coffee, and it's just a normal conversation, right? The minute that car door opened, that <laughs> show was on. He was went nature to, boy. He went to hollered and whooping and everything else. Then he'd get back in the car, and the uh, talk was normal again. So, Ken, in a different way, that's you. You know, as we watch you on the radio show, uh, it's like you put a cape on. When we have lunch together, normal conversation. But my goodness, when you get behind that mic, it takes off, brother. Well, I, I get it's, it's intoxicating. Um, Ronnie, I don't know that I'm a character. I consider that a compliment, and, and I mean that Absolutely. sincerely. I come from characters. I admire characters. I respect characters. I believe with all my heart the characters of what built the country. Uh, you know, I think of the meek and mild, the bold and brash, and the bold and brash have always, in my humble opinion, made a bigger difference in in my life than the meek and mild. But um, you know, and and and, and I, I, I think you'll agree with me when I say this: the majority of perceptions we have and beliefs that we hold come from the events and experiences that we've lived. And I mean, I, I didn't live. A, a typical life. I mean, my father 
was a big influence on my life. And I've talked a lot about my dad. I've told you stories about my father. My father would charge hell with a water pistol and dare, dare the devil to get in his way. I mean, that's just <laughs> the way he was wired. And, and that was the, the, the maternal influence in my life. I mean, that, that was my, my, my male dominant, you know, uh, hero. And, um, so, so I guess to some degree in the subconscious, I'm trying to measure up, you know, my, my father left a legacy and the legacy was a bit of a character and, and I don't want to, I don't want to fall down and, and not, I don't know, carry on the legacy of a, of a character. And, um, so, so yeah, I mean, when you say Ken's a character, I don't take it as an insult. I mean, I, I consider it to be a uh, quite the compliment. It's of a high compliment, sir. We look back in our lives, and probably for you like me, coaches, pastors, politicians, but everybody seems to be we're moving toward a state of, like, robotic. I mean, people are the same. And so I miss those characters. Let me share two things with you before we deep dive. Okay, okay sure, sure. Because you just used a kinism just a moment ago, right? Two of the biggest characters of my life, and, and both of these guys are still living. I think you'll enjoy this. Um Two guys are African American buddies uh, that I've enjoyed a friendship with. They grew up on a farm, right? And they developed a little system where they could take a break on a farm. We're always looking for a break on the farm, right? And so they got the going off to it. They'd ask to go to the bathroom. Tell the day they're going to run to the bathroom, right? And uh, depending on what kind of business you did, there was a longer period of time. So they did it so often, his daddy came back and said, All right, boys, show me something on a stick. That's the kind of stuff, you know? And then quickly, uh, I've got a, a law enforcement buddy that I grew up with, and I'll, I'll remain anonymous to protect the innocent, right? But he got more uh, uh, criminals to uh, confess than anybody else. And here's what he did. He'd get in there, and no matter what they did, I mean, they, it could have been a serious charge, right? He'd look at him and say, come on, boy, relax. You ain't killed the president. Where do you go from there, right? It, it's all down here from there. So he got so many confessions that way. Ken, let's go ahead and dive in, okay? okay sure. Uh, and I got a series of things, and I'm interested in these answers too. Uh, you speak so often of, of family, and I know that's so important with you. So let's let's take it on back when growing up as a child. What was it like in your household with your mom your dad, your your siblings. Let's talk a little I, bit about. I, I kind of had the best of both worlds. Uh, my mom was a devout re religious lady. She was, uh, I don't know, the steady hand in my family. My mom was afflicted with rheumatoid arthritis at twenty eight, and in an era where weren't a lot of treatments. I mean, it was real debilitating, and my mom struggled with rheumatoid arthritis as long as I can remember. I mean, I was born in sixty three. My mom would have been 23 or 4 when she had me. I was the firstborn of three kids. But but I don't, I mean, from, from the age of being able to remember anything, my mom always had arthritis. Mm. And it was always a struggle. Um, Just her moving around. Yeah, yeah her joints hurt. My mom worked at the post office part-time. Um, and then I, I'll get into that. My, my dad... You know, even back in the day, health insurance. My, my dad said, hey, if you can get that job at the post office, saves a lot of money on health insurance. Mm -hmm. And he was always angling and, and things like that. But, 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 but my mom, my mom was not a character at all. My mom was a godly woman, a Proverbs lady, mm -hmm. um, the, the best mother you could ever imagine, the most moral and ethical person that I knew. Um, and then you had my dad. And, uh, and I've always wondered um, when they say opposites attract, they must have been talking about my mom <laughs> and my dad because my dad didn't do anything by the book. <laughs> I mean, my, my dad was, you, you said earlier, character. My dad was a character to the nth degree and, and lived the majority of his life in that lane. I mean, he, he very seldom conformed. He very seldom respected authority. Um, I saw that as an early at an early age, and I heard conversations with my mom and dad about, you know, my dad's name was Jimmy, my mom's name was Margie, but I can remember my mom saying, Jimmy, you're going to get in trouble doing that. Well, hell, if I get in trouble, I'll just get in trouble, but that's the way it's got to be done, and I'm doing it that way, and I mean, you, you know I love you, and I want to be there for you, but but I, I got to do it this way, and um, but but my, my wife gives me, I think, a, a great compliment in saying that that I got some of the attributes. Got a lot of negative things about it, but I got I got some attributes from both my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. um, the the best quality I got from my mom is not judging people. Mm -hmm. uh, you're from a small town. I'm from a small town. My mom never judged a single person. 
richest person in town, poorest person in town, uh, a, a, you know, a devoutly religious Christian like her, some heathen mm-hmm. on the other side of town. My mom didn't grade people. Mm-hmm. And, and my brother and sister and I saw a woman who basically treated everybody just the same. And that left a mark on me. I mean, that, that sincerely, I don't know that it was, I don't know that, that, that I absorbed it at the moment. But as she lived it, I mean, it became elemental in my life. I mean, it was it was a part of who I am and a part I've tried to. I guess if I if, if I think about honoring my, my mom, Rodney, that would be the way. Right. It would be to never judge people, um, people with a lot of money, people with no money, people with a lot of education, no education, people who cuss a lot, people who don't cuss a lot. That's not for me to decide, you know. But 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 rather treat them and meet them um, where they are. Early in life, my dad and and I, I'm, I'm thinking about my my father. Hard charger, you know, go getter. I mean, all those things would have fit. I, I can remember, and I said this a lot when I ran for lieutenant governor. I can remember uh, my mom struggling with arthritis, but making what we call supper. I know we got fancy now as breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Where I come from is breakfast, dinner, and and supper. But I remember my mom, you know, fixing. And ain't no G on that. Fixing supper, and uh, and my dad had an El Camino, and my father would walk from Marshall and Company where he worked in the day and he would, and he, and he started this little, you know, kind of a side business of building a building truck beds. And he'd walk over to that little metal building and he'd stay in on nine or 10 or 11 o'clock, whatever it took, whatever it took to get the job done. And my mom would, would take my brother and I and, and, and kind of put us in the car and we drive down to the metal building and we sit on the tailgate of that El Camino, <laughs> which was kind of half truck, half car, you know, back in the day Lovely. and we'd eat supper. And, um, my dad didn't go to many ball games, um, Rodney, one of the great lessons that I, and I've said this on the airways, I think, um, we live in an age now and you're talking about lack of characters. And I, I don't know if we got less testosterone today than we've ever had. And I'm not, I'm not begrudging of anybody who lives their life as they choose to live it. But, but my father told me more than one time that, um, I know you got a game and I hear you're pretty good, <laughs> but, but I got three Fords and a Mack truck that I got to get out by Friday and I just can't go. I mean, I, I've obligated myself to the bank, and, and my father never referred to it as the bank. It was always Al Mund. <laughs> I don't ever remember my dad saying the bank. I, I'm, I'm going to the bank. No, I'm going to Al Mund. I got to go see Al Mund. And they always traded. I mean, you didn't oh, buy, oh, yeah. you traded. Uh, yeah, and it was it was a relationship world. It was yeah. all about you know you take care of me and I take care of you. And but um but but my father would tell me, you know, I can't I can't go. I mean, I you know I'm trying to build this business. I'm trying to make a better way and. And, and, and if I go to your game or your practice, I'm two hours behind at work. And that, that was an important lesson to me. I don't know that I was angry with my dad, but I did wonder, why are all the other parents here but mine aren't? You know, my mom was there, I mean, just at everything. I mean, she would be there. She, she kind of, you know, ushered my mom, or excuse me, my brother and I. I, I had kind of a unique situation that, that if you don't believe the good Lord works in mysterious ways, my brother and I are 17 months apart. I, I'm the oldest of three. My sister was born 11 years later, um, similar to what I've got. My two boys are 11, 17 months apart, uh, hmm. and and their baby sister is nine years. I'm trying to think, too, uh, seven years their junior. I'm trying to think. I want to make sure I get this right. My wife will correct me. Um, <laughs> 90, 92, and two, 11 years. 1992 and 2003. So there was a lot of similarities in my brother, me, my brother, my sister, and then my three kids. And, um, but, but, uh, you know, life was good. I mean, I don't remember. I mean, I've said this before. I don't remember when in the journey I realized that we were still a blue collar family, but we were living better than most people in my hometown. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, my father started the business in 1963. I, I'll tell you a story, and I think this would be an interesting story, talking about characters. Um, my grandfather retired from Marshall Lumber Company after 60 years of service. Wow. I mean, he would have never considered leaving there. Well, he got my, my uncle, my dad's brother, and my, and my dad a job at Marshall Lumber Company. It was a big sawmill there in Pamplico. And Mr. Marsh... Mr. J.E. Marsh, who was the, you know, the owner of Marshall Lumber Company, they were in High Point, still have a cabinet company in High Point. But um, he knew my dad was moonlighting. <laughs> he knew my dad would leave work and, and, and go kind of 
piddle around and, and, and work on trucks and build truck beds and whatever it was he was doing. And he went to my grandfather and said, look, I, I don't want Jimmy doing that. I mean, I, I don't want Jimmy doing that. I want him to focus on this job I got for him. And, and if he'll stop that nonsense he's doing, I'll give him another 75 cent on the hour. And I don't know what the pay was back then, but that would have been, yeah, yeah, that would have been very considerable back in the day. So my grandfather went to my father and said, hey, I talked to Mr. Marsh, and he ain't crazy about you moonlighting. He's not crazy about this side business you started. He wants you to um, stop doing that, and he's willing to give you, you know, 75 cents more on the hour and put you in line to be sawmill supervisor. And my dad said, okay, let, let me think about it. Came back about a week later. Mr. Marsh went to my granddad and said, have you talked to Jimmy? Yeah. What, what has he decided? I don't know, but I'll find out today. Went back to my dad, and my dad said, I, I'm not going to do that. And my grandfather kind of sat him down. Said, son, you don't understand. It's a crazy world out there. I mean, this family takes good care of you. They're good people to work for. It's a good business. It's job security. And my dad said, yeah, but I kind of want to blaze my own trail. I mean, I want to do my own thing. Um, they had a couple of other conversations. At the end of the day, my dad had to go into Mr. Marsh's office and tell Mr. Marsh he was leaving. And my dad tells me the story. I mean, he's passed away now, but my dad said how scared he was. You know, I mean, the man he respected as much as anybody in the business world kind of set an example of how you run a business and how you take care of customers. But he had to go sit down across from that man's desk and say, I appreciate the offer. I appreciate the kindness and the gesture, but but I, I'm going to try to make a go of it on my own. And I may get emotional, and I'm sorry, it's real. I mean, it's very real to me. Said Mr. Marsh reached in his desk drawer, and gave him a check for twenty five hundred dollars, mm. and said, "You put that in your book, and I'll put it in mine." How about that? Good How about luck. That? How about that? The world That's don't operate that. like that anymore, Rodney. You're right. Yeah. And and my father said when he walked out of that office with that twenty five hundred dollar check, he said, "Ain't no damn way I'll fail now. Yeah. I mean, there, there ain't no way in this world that I can't make it in business." And and those gestures, twenty five hundred dollars in nineteen, that would have been probably nineteen sixty six or seven, about three or four years after my dad moonlighting. I mean, that was transformational in his world, in his business life. And um, and the man that wanted him to stay, but once figured out he wasn't gonna stay, wanted to be a part of sending him off, wishing him nothing but the best. And and I and I guess that's the 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 the, the feature of character. That you're talking about. You, you, you've adopted that. Even even in, in my circumstances, you've tried to help me. And I, I see you trying to help a lot of people. You think it derives from from that? Was that a lesson that just cemented into you? Well, I mean, I, I just think we're, we're obligated to help one another. Yeah. I mean, I sincerely believe that. I've been blessed. I mean, I, I told you, we ate, we ate supper on the tailgate of an El Camino. <laughs> and the next thing you know, my dad's buying a piece of property, building a 60 by 120 metal building. And then we built another 60 by 120 metal building. Something else my dad told me, and I've, told, I've said this recently, my dad was a hard worker. I mean, there ain't no doubt about it. He would get up earlier, stay up later, work harder, try harder. But my dad told me one day, and I'll never forget it. He said, son, a lot of damn people work hard and don't make money. I mean, don't believe that working hard always leads to making more money. There's a lot of people that get up early, stay up late, work hard, and just don't ever end up on the side or the good side of finance and business. I don't want you to ever lose sight of nothing's guaranteed. You know, you get up early, stay up late, work hard. It doesn't guarantee you financial success. But but I, I guess understanding, uh, and maybe it's subconscious, maybe maybe it's more conscious than I want to give it credit for, But but it is rare. For someone to do what my dad did. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, it's very rare for someone to plow up rows of tobacco, pour a concrete slab. Mm -hmm. Now, you're standing at no stoplights in a town with no stoplight. And when I left that business in 2008, we had a neighborhood of 100 employees. Wow. And those were 100 families that depended on us, um, counting on us, uh, making good decisions, uh, bad decisions. Uh, you know, my, my father, and, and I don't want to get real poetic but but my father was my idol my hero and the ghost that haunts every day of my existence i, I understand that completely i mean it, he he is up here for me i mean he i hold him in the highest regard you can imagine because he gave me everything that i've got but he was a ghost he was demanding. What age were you when he passed away? Uh, I was in 2004, yeah. uh, 41. 41. Yeah, yeah. And, and and all of a sudden, you know, the corner office is empty. Yeah. 
And, and as much as my brother and I thought we were ready to run that business, hell, I mean, it, it's all of a sudden, here you are. You want it, have at it. Um, and, and that was scary. I mean, that, that was a scary time in my life. My sister passed away in 2001 at, unexpectedly at 29 years old. And, and, and I, you know, we're, we're going to get down to everything here. So I, and I'll tell you, my, the, the, the toughest man that I'd ever known in my life, the hardest driven man that I'd ever known in my life, lost his 29-year-old daughter, and it broke him. My, my dad didn't die of a heart attack. My dad of a broken heart. Mm. I mean, I, I'm convinced of that. Uh, you know, he died. I mean, I, I guess I guess the death certificate says heart attack. But but my dad, when, when my sister passed away at the age of 29 in 2001, a lot of my dad died. A, a lot of my dad died. Dwell on that because that was a significant part of your life. Dwell on uh, your sister's sickness. How, how did that take place? My sister was 11 years my junior. Uh, excuse me, eight years my junior, and she was afflicted with spinal muscular atrophy. Um, my, here, here, here's my dad. My sister was slow to walk, and my mom would help her. Proverbs lady, helping somebody that needs help. My daddy said she's lazy. Quit helping her. You got to make her walk on her own. It's kind of a self-made, you know, that mentality of old yeah, school. Old school. Yes, There's no doubt about it. And my mom kept saying, Jimmy, something's wrong with her. Ain't nothing wrong with her. You, you're letting her be lazy. L let her sit there. She'll eventually get up. Well, I mean, things didn't go as planned. And, and, and sooner or later, I don't remember when, man, I'm a little boy. You know what I mean? I'm playing with GI Joes and, 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 you know, trying to play baseball in the yard. But, but at some point in time, my mom and dad sat my brother and I down and said, you know, something's wrong with Nikki. That was my, my sister's name. And we're going to carry her to a hospital in, I think it might have been Charleston first. Went to Charleston, um, found out she had this rare muscular disorder. Eventually ended up at, I think, Montreal, a hospital in Montreal. Ran into a doctor named Dr. Rick Reed. Um, but, but Rodney, I watched, remember what we talking about. The, the man that thought he could fix everything. All of a sudden, had the, the most precious thing in this world, and he was helpless. Yeah, I mean, he couldn't fix it. And I watched him struggle, and I watched him. I mean, I, I watched him just, just really, really, really try to come to grips with. Okay, they're telling me my daughter can't walk, but they don't know who I am. They, I fix things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I don't take no for an answer. I work harder. I try harder. I end up on the good side of everything. And 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 it was a, it was kind of a long, drawn-out problem. My mama accepted it. Proverbs lady, God's will, you know, for whatever reason, God's given us a different child, different kind of child, and we got to deal with this uh, the best we know how. My dad didn't do good at all. Yeah. My, my dad really struggled with, once again, the most precious thing in his world was going to be confined to a wheelchair, and she was. She was confined to a wheelchair. They gave her a life expectancy of somewhere in the neighborhood of eight years. Gosh. I mean, I remember that. I remember mom and dad sitting, my brother and I, saying, look, everything we hear leads us to believe that this is a very progressive disease. It, it kind of, um, I mean, it takes over the body. It overwhelms the body, and eventually, I mean, it, it'll just, it, it, she, she'll constrict to a point she can't breathe. She can't, anyway, she'll die. Um, the doctor in Montreal gave my father some help. And my dad came back home. Once again, we're little boys. But my dad came back home and said, look, the doctor in Montreal said she probably, he never would say never, she probably won't ever walk. Mm -hmm. But he thinks he can extend her life pretty significantly. And they went in the calves of her muscle and cut out tissue and ligaments. And they put a steel rod in her back. And she got a body cast and all these other sorts of things. And um, and she lived 29 years and died from, from gallbladder surgery. Wow. Uh, had nothing to do with her disease. Went wow. in for gallbladder surgery. Um, had an issue. Got real internally infected. Uh, sepsis set in. And, and she passed away at, at age 29 uh, three days before 9-11. Gosh. Uh, I'm sorry, five, September 6, 2001. What was her demeanor? Was she? Uh, she was Miss Wheelchair America. She traveled around the country as a Christian witness. She had a van um, with a steering wheel about this big around that she could drive with her finger. Um, By herself? So yeah, my, my, my wife gives the best take on this of anybody. I mean, I'm so damn stupid, and she's smart, and I mean, I'm talking all the time and not listening, and she's very in tune 
you know, with, with her faith. And my wife said, I mean, it's obvious to me why your dad was successful in business. To begin with, what are the odds of somebody starting a business in a tobacco field in a town with no stop line and ended up doing, you know, fairly well in business? God had a plan for your sister, and it required resources. And somebody had to be able to buy a van mm. and stereo equipment and recording equipment and fly her to the, to the Grammys and all these other. And, you know, people that don't make any money can't do that. Mm. So, so my wife has convinced me that the only reason my father was blessed in business is because God had a plan. I'm going to give you this daughter later in life that's going to have some issues. Right. Um, and my sister, once again, Miss Wheelchair America, um, traveled all over the country as a Christian witness. Um did a lot of fundraising for the Spinal Muscular Atrophy Association. But but my, my sister, um, my, my mom and dad's strategy on my sister was never tell her what she can't do. Let her figure it out. Right. She was in a wheelchair and went out for, you know, like, like middle school basketball. Okay. Well, hell, she can't play middle school basketball in a wheelchair. But, but mom and dad said, she'll figure that out. <laughs> I, I mean, let, let's not tell her she can't. She'll figure that out. And eventually, I think she may have come home one day and said, I can't do this. I mean, this is crazy for me to get in the way. I'll find something else to do. And she, she kept busy finding other things to do. So I lost the timeline here. Um, I'm not that smart either, Ken. So did your children ever get to know her, or was she long past by the time? No, but both my boys got to know her. She died in 01. Libby, my daughter, who was named um, – my my sister's name was Nikki Mm Allisonard. Libby's name is Elizabeth Allisonard. Um, Libby was born in 03, so she never – Never met my mom. Well, not she met my mom. Uh, Lee was born in 03. Daddy died in 04. Um, Mama died in 06. Nikki died in 01. Man, I had a rough patch there. You sure did. I mean, I had about that's, five that's years lot. there that, that that really, really sucked. And I get the the dates mixed up. But, um, you know, my, my, my wife, and, and I, I can confide in you, and I don't care who watches and listens, but my wife believes that I never dealt with all that. Uh. You know, she. I, I'm once again. My father's influence. Don't whine. Don't cry. Don't pout. Don't lay on the couch. Get up. And move and go. Everything's fine. But there are some things kicking when you have that traumatic of events and, and that condensed a period of time. I tell people about losing parents and loved ones. I mean, it's a layer of insulation. Mm-hmm. You know that that's there, and then it kind it kind of goes away, and you feel. I mean, that there, there's this fancy clinical phrase called uh, abandonment. Theory and, and and people that don't deal with abandonment, they, they eventually kind of they struggle with why and, and and what if and but no, uh, my 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 baby girl was born in '03 and my and my baby sister died in '01 and I don't have many regrets, right. but that's one. Yeah. I mean, I would have rather my baby girl be born in '01 and my sister die in '03. Yeah, but I don't get to call the shots. That's good Lord in heaven and and the world works a lot of times in ways that I don't much like. Well, I got to tell you, you can't underestimate the intuition of a woman and the things they know. I mean, they know how to deal with this stuff. We're, we're not really equipped with that the way they are. We're jeeps. Yeah. So let's let's move on on into, we're still talking about family. Let's talk about your family. And, and another reason why I know you're a character, right? Uh, both you and I, as you mentioned earlier, we're our kindred spirits, but we're not much to look at. You had to do a lot of talking to marry that pretty girl you're, I did. you're married to. I did. She seems as sweet as she can be. And I don't know her. I can, I can just, I can just feel it. So, Tell us about that courtship, and then move right on into your her. Your her children. brother was a year older than I was, and they moved to Pamplico. I think my wife was in the third grade. I mean, I think my her brother may have been in the fourth grade, and her brother and I developed a real good friendship. He loved the Gamecocks. I loved the Gamecocks. Mm-hmm. He loved the Braves. I loved the Braves. He loved sports in general. I loved sports in general. But I remember the first time that either I went to his house or he came to mine. Teddy's his name. Teddy Kennedy. Not the liberal politician, but rather, you know, and I thought I was married one of them Kennedys, but I found out, no, no, no. that ain't no Kennedy from Hyannisport. That's a Kennedy from Kennedy's Crossroad, you know, down on the end of the Shade Road. But anyway, um, somewhere along the way, when, when her brother and I were developing this friendship that still exists today, he's one of the, the best friends I got in the world. He's a CPA, he's a little grad. Um, I don't know if I went to his house or he came to mine, but I saw her in the car. (laughs) And, I mean, that would have been the early phases of testosterone, you know what I mean? (laughs) I mean, I was starting to understand what gasoline and perfume smell like (laughs) at at the same time. And then he became a dear friend after that. I mean, he was a good friend, <laughs> but once I saw his sister, he became he and became a he real a value to your yeah, life. Yeah, he became a real dear friend. Now, my strategy 
was to make sure I got her before she found anybody better. <laughs> Pamplico ain't big. So it's slim pickings, you know what I mean? And I knew that as long as I could keep her kind of kind of confined to Pamplico, I had a fight. I got a good chance. Don't now, let her it, slip to Florence to show Oh, oh I'm done. I mean, I'm done. If she gets to Florence, and good the God, Columbia boys. or Greenville. Or, yeah, yeah. I mean, them city boys would have whined and dined, or I know how to whine and, <laughs> and dine. But um, so so my, my, my grand strategy was, okay, pin her down. You know, get get her locked up before before she goes off and see somebody ten times as as good as I. We've been married thirty seven years. We've been together about all of our lives. Um, it ain't been a bed of roses every moment of every day. You know that. I mean, marriage is complicated and hard. But um, and and once again, I don't remember if it was his house or my house. But the first time I saw her, I mean, w- th- there there's a reason that that ninety five percent of the Corvette sold in America sold to men. We're visually stimulated. That's right. I don't give a damn how we are or how, you know, whatever. And um, and and when I saw her, I said, okay, okay. I, I'll figure out a way for he and I to be to be really, really, really good friends. And um, and out of that came a, a friendship that was not a courtship, mm-hmm. but eventually it kind of morphed into, you know, hey, you want to go out? Yeah. And we started going out. And, you know, next thing you know, I, <laughs> I popped the question. She said yes. Um, I will say this, talking about characters, we stayed married 120 days, and I wasn't doing right. You know what I mean? I didn't take to it right. as good as as good as she did. And I remember her exact quote. She said, you may drive a woman crazy, but it ain't going to be me. I'm going back to mom and daddy. I didn't sign up for this. Because Rodney, we talked about sports. I had started playing a lot of slow pitch softball. Uh-huh. Well, slow pitch softball ain't nothing but an excuse to drink a bunch of beer. <laughs> yeah. And you lose track of time. You know what I mean? <laughs> like golf. Oh, uh, yeah. And you start lying about you in the loser's bracket. And you ain't in no damn. You've, you've lost out at three o'clock in the afternoon, but your buddy there drinking beer and you want to drink beer with them. And I'd get on the, you know, you didn't have cell phones back in the day. You had those pay phones and we drive to the pay phone. Everybody called our girlfriends or wives or whatever and tell a lie and tell them we in the loser's bracket. We don't play again until 10 and it might be 12 before we get home. Um, um, but, but, you know, uh, and, and I'll go back to my mom. Um, seems like every time in my life when things get awry and I don't know heads or tails and I don't know which way's up, I end up at mama's house. Mm-hmm. Always ended up at my, as much as I mm-hmm. love daddy and respect the daddy and looked up to daddy when things, when, 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 when my car was in the ditch, I didn't go see Daddy. Oh, no. I, I went to see Mama. And and I remember when Tammy left, and, and we you know we were concerned about not being able to put it back together. I went to see my and Mama. They probably had a great relationship. Oh, my Lord. My, 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 my wife thought my Mama walked on water, and my wife thought uh, my Mama thought my wife walked on water. They could have, you know, left or take me, but, but <laughs> and, you know. Uh, but but my Mama sat me down and counseled me. And and encourage me to, to stop being that. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you can't you can't married men can't behave like that. They can't do that. I joke around now. Um, I tell people Tammy's been married thirty seven years. I've been married about thirty five. <laughs> the first two years I, I wasn't real good at it, but but it was interesting when 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 I had myself in that conundrum. I didn't go seek daddy's counsel. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't go to talk. To, I mean, money and business and finance, and I'd get myself in a in a pinch there. I'd always go to daddy, but in, in that situation, and Mama told me exactly what I wanted to hear. Well, you know, he probably wasn't very equipped to give that either. If your dad was like mine, and you know, the same era, my daddy was hardcore. Honestly, he was a great man, but you know, he never told me he loved me to his dying days. That just wasn't part of what they did. But you knew he loved but you. I absolutely they never doubted it. No, no question. I can about relate it. to that. But you know, so I would warm up. My mama would give me all. All that. And speaking all that, so, you know, and, and one thing I did, uh, you know, I truly made the transition. My, I've got one son. A day don't go by. He's a rock star. I don't, I don't tell him. Yeah. He is. He he's is. He's a medical. Absolutely. Yeah, he's a Fans rock star. So proud of him. I keep up with him on Facebook. But I tell him I love him every day. I do the same. You know? I, I do mean, the same. I, I don't hang the phone up with any of my kids yeah. without telling them I love them. Yeah. Now, now and, I, and I want to reiterate, I never questioned my dad's love. No, right, I, th- 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 maybe yeah. that was just that generation. It was. They just didn't verbalize they it. They were hard, and you know, they were, they were, you know, they, 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 it's just a different era. It's the only thing Very I can much. account for. Very much so. so. But you know, you've got wonderful children. Uh, I developed a relationship with one of one mm-hmm. of your, your sons. Lot. Fantastic, fantastic, and you know, and he's the one that had the biggest struggle in my life. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, he, um, my my oldest son was born 
with a uh, uh, I don't it's not a, it's not a disease it's not it's a condition I guess he's got a um, fibula deficiency in his leg he was born with one leg about three and a half inches shorter than another leg and we carried him from hospital to hospital trying to figure out what to do what not to do who's got the best advice who doesn't have um, the best advice and in the process. He had, I think my son's had, Rodney, 16 surgeries and about three or four procedures. And by procedures, I'm talking about pick lines and all these other um, sorts of things. And we realized, and I've talked to you about this, we realized during the surgeries, and, and I, you know, I think the first surgery was at about 12 or 13 years old. The last was at about 24, five years old. There was about a decade there that he had, you know, seemed like every year he's got a surgery. Mm -hmm. They got to twist a hip. They got to break an ankle. They got to shave uh, the bottom of his heel and move it. The whole struggle with his condition was the, the, the symmetry of his leg. His hip, knee, and ankle were never in symmetry one with another, and it created all these, all these stress points. And the, um, um, the hip. The ankle, the, the, the knee was always hurting and, and giving him problems, so they'd go in there and do something to do something else. We had external fixators installed on his leg, and I'd turn a screw mm. four times a day that would actually lengthen that leg. They laser broke the bone, and they lengthened his leg. But, um, I mean, I remember the first night I turned the screw, and he yelled and screamed, please don't do this. Uh -huh. And I thought to myself, what in the world have we done? But we're too far down this road. Anyway, all those surgeries, all those procedures – he was prescribed OxyContin. And in retrospect, Rodney, he tells me that he knew he liked it at 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. That there's this, I mean, I've, I've studied it and tried to understand it. Um, and I don't want to get political about, you know, the, 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 the opioid epidemic and what caused it and what we should have done that we didn't do and what we need to do now that we aren't doing, um, that we could do a podcast on that on that another day. Anyway, I, I, I noticed that my oldest son's self-esteem was leaving um, he may be on time. He may not. Never had any money. You felt like he was sneaking around about everything he did. And we realized, I mean, my wife and I, and you probably had this situation. You know there's a storm cloud brewing. Mm -hmm. You know it. I mean, you know something's not right, but you kind of hit your knees and pray to God, please tell me I'm wrong. Please tell me what I'm expecting isn't true and what I'm thinking isn't, isn't right. Um, my wife and I knew a couple of years before we accepted that we had a problem with addiction. Um, I was in the West Florence parking lot one night picking up Libby from cheer practice. And um, we're good to go. Well, I mean, he called me and said something had happened in our, in our world that, that was un undoubtedly wrong. I mean, we knew it was wrong. It was a, and, and, and we had to be, we had to answer for it. It wasn't anything we'd done, but we're family and we got to deal with it together. But he'd done something that under no condition would he have done that. I mean, he just didn't make any sense for him to do that, but he did it. He did it. He told me. Uh, and I, and I, had to, I had to pin him down. I said, hey, man, I'm, I, you know, I've been told this and I can't let that slide. I mean, I, I can't let that slide. And he broke down and said, I can't stop taking pain pills. I, I, I can't stop taking pain pills. I need help. And we sent him off. Um, thank God in heaven, we had a little bit of money and, you know, some resources. And we sent him off to a place in Dahlonega, Georgia, um, that's affiliated with Mount Sinai Hospital in, in New York. And I mean, it's a world-class treatment center and, and, and I don't want to go into what, you know, what happens to the brain when it gets so addicted to opioids and Oxycontin being an opiate based medicine, but, um, but he went off and, 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 and got sober and got clean and it's been that way for going on seven years. He's building a life for himself. You've helped him. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do, but he wanted to get away from here and get a fresh start. He's down in um in, in Pauly's Island living now, and he's working in the golf business. He's actually, you know, golf and tourism and hospitality and, uh, you know, one of these companies that has hotels and managed golf courses and all, and he's gotten real, really involved in that. But that, that's probably some of the darkest days I've ever had in my life. Uh, you know, I... I, I, I I watched my dad struggle with my sister and I can relate me struggling with my son. Cause that, that, those were dark days and those are helpless days. And, and we made it very public. Mm. And, and the reason, and I've talked to my son, I said, Hey, there are people out there ashamed and embarrassed and, and, and scared to death to tell anybody what they're dealing with. We could be a beacon of hope. 
I mean, there can be a lot of good here. We can publicly say that, hey, don't be ashamed, don't be embarrassed. Um, you, you know this. You, you were in politics, but but it's um, I mean, it's an epidemic. Yeah. No I mean, there, there there are millions of families, and, and I tell people all the time, it don't care if you're Republican, a Democrat, rich, poor, white, black, man, woman, it doesn't matter. Opioids is um. It, it, it's something that our nation needs to get its arms around. And, and once again, I don't want to blame, you know, anybody for that, but, but it was very personal with me. And, um, and, and w- the thing you love most in this world are your kids. Absolutely. And when you go to bed every night and you worry that your phone may go off and it's law enforcement saying they found your kid and he's in a hospital because he got an opiate laced with fentanyl and he's in critical or serious condition, or somebody calls and says he's he's dead. I feel, in in a way you can imagine, for the families that are dealing with that. And there's hope. I mean, there's a way to get better on on the other side. And and you know that that's part of our reasoning for trying to make our story public. I mean, I'm kind of a public figure to some degree, and and you know, it, it would be easier not to tell anybody. Yeah. And make sure nobody ever knows about that. But I just think there's some good to come of us sharing that story. Listen, I was so privileged to learn that story. And your son is a champion among champions. I was so impressed with him. And, you know, had it not been rooted in in, in, in family like you, I say today, and I think you could probably say the thing as you describe your mom, our mothers was very much alike. I wouldn't be here today had my mama not prayed for me every day. Night. Rodney, I don't know if you remember wholesale and SIDS and dimensions yeah, yeah, yeah. and all those places. Hell, I didn't leave home until 11 o'clock on Saturday night to or go, Friday night to go. To go. <laughs> and my mom, now she didn't tell me then because <laughs> I wouldn't listen anyway, but my mom would put her hand on my car uh-huh, and pray for and you. say, God, he ain't got sense enough to come home on his own. <laughs> Please, some way, somehow get him home. You and know, and affected. don't believe that that wasn't affected. Well, I mean, I'd like to believe it was. A thousand percent. Yeah, I mean, God hears prayers. I mean, he, why do we pray if he doesn't? You know what I mean? Let's end this segment. Just, I want to, re- your son's a one percenter, and that is a story to be told. And, and look, uh, it takes courage to tell it, uh, but that can touch so many lives because so often the case, that isn't the way it ends up. So kudos to him. Let's move into another quick segment because uh, you'll mention it at times on your radio show but obviously through you what you've been through and a couple more segments that we'll go through that just you've persevered in so many ways so let's let's just talk about your your faith for a minute uh you know you were probably introduced at an early age but what is your faith kid? i How became can... a christian because of a drug problem mm-hmm. talking gotcha. about my kids drug problem. i was drugged to church I gotcha. <laughs> on sunday morning sunday evening Same and here. wednesday night whether i wanted to go or not now, the benefit to Wednesdays was chicken bar. <laughs> At the First Baptist Church in Pamplica, we had family night. I was First Baptist. And, and they'd feed you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then um, we, had, we had a youth choir on Sunday afternoons, and it was about two-thirds girls and one-third boys. <laughs> so, whatever, so it's always, I, I can't sing, but I'm going to choir <laughs> practice, you know, because because my, my, my best friend's sister would, would, would always go, and that was a chance for us to bump into one another. Now, I mean, faith has always been... I mean, it is, it's the key to my life. I mean, it's, um, it, I don't wear it on my shirt sleeve. I talk publicly about it. Mm-hmm. I am a, uh, you know, I'm a Christian. I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I'll say this, Rodney, about my faith. Um, my mom, well, let's chronologically, my, my sister, my father, my mother died at a very condensed period of time. And I probably grew in my faith more during that period I mean, I was mad with God, but who wouldn't be? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm questioning God, but who wouldn't question? Um, I want to know why. I mean, why did my 29-year-old sister, my 63-year-old mom, and my 63-year-old dad have to die in such a, a short period of time and leave me and my brother hanging? Yeah. I mean, God, if you love us, why are you going to do that Do that to us? But but that that's really, Rodney, when I... I mean, I, another poetic word. I mean, I'm a big Dylan Springsteen fan. They're yeah. famous for wordsmith. But that that's kind of when I began to yearn. I mean, I, you know, baptized as a young believer. I mean, I don't know what I'm believing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I, my mom said do it. And my mom ain't going to mislead me. Right. She loves me too much to lead me astray. I'm in Sunday school. I'm in church. I'm hearing the preacher say these things. But but my sister dying in 01 forced me to, in, in, a, in a kind of an analytical way, in a philosophical way, understand, understand my faith. Why do I believe um, in the gospel of Jesus. Why do I believe that there was a virgin birth 
a crucifixion and a resurrection. I mean, how supernatural is that? I mean, it's the most supernatural thing you could imagine. And I started reading everything I could get my hands on. I started aggravating preachers that I respected. I mean, I got a bit theological trying to understand the science and philosophy and I, I, I guess the um, the archaeology of my faith. And, um, and, and I wanted to be able to say, okay, it's not because my mom said it, but rather something I fundamentally believe in. And if I believe in it, I got to make it a part of my life. And I, and I tried to make it a big part of my life. And I tried to make it a big part of me being a, a father and a husband. And, I, man, I fail miserably. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of the stuff I say and do, you'd say, what, really? <laughs> I mean, he's a follower of Christ. But but grace, forgiveness, and mercy mm-hmm. are something that, that that have been granted to me. And, I, and I'm thankful for it every day. But, um, I mean, as we get older, and you know this, you're going to experience more heartache. I mean, the, the, the people, I mean, you probably had some friends your age die. Sure. I've had a couple my age die. The people that I respected and admired are beginning to die. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're, they're in their 80s. I mean, the life expectancy in America is about 80. So we're, you know, I'm bumping into death a lot more. than, And I'm starting to think a little bit about my mortality. But, um, but, but I toyed around with faith for a long time, grew up in the church, never really took it serious and never let it be. You know, kind of an essential part of my life, but but I have, and, and I'm very comfortable in my faith. I'm very um, comfortable discussing it and and talking about it. I, I I don't bombard people with witnessing. I mean, I, I don't go to Starbucks and say, you know, give me a vanilla latte and you know Jesus. You know, that just ain't my style. Right, but but yeah, if somebody yeah. gives me an opportunity, hey man, what matters to you? Yeah. And and I'll say, hey, my family. You know, my my. I mean, a lot of things matter to me, but at the end of the day. You know, my, my faith has to come first, and, and that kind of opens the door, and, and we start, you know, having these conversations. Ronnie, the, what, what scares the hell out of me is that people through the radio, and I guess my political life, they listen to what I say. Mm. And, and, and I think, I mean, knowing where I come from and knowing how screwed up I am, why would anybody listen to what I say? And I've had to kind of adjust some of, <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, some of the... um some of the ways I think about things because people do pay attention to what I say and that's scary. I mean, don't, don't do it. Don't pay attention to what I say, but, 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 um, you know, yeah. I mean, when you, when you ask about my faith, it is, I mean, it, it is, I know this so cliche and, and, and you expect me to, it's the anchor in my life. I mean, it's truly the anchor. And, and when my sister died, when my mom died, when my dad died, when my son was addicted, uh, when, when, when my brother and I get in an argument about something, when my wife and I are mad at one another, when, when, when the money don't add up, when the business ain't going good. I mean, I just think about God. I, I think about his love and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness in the grand scheme of things. I mean, it's all a fart in the wind anyway. Let me let me reassure you that that I see it in you, Ken. I really do. And as you reflect back on your life, and as we go through this and this next quick segment, I'll uh, even verify it. I mean, you've you've been through an awful lot. And had you not had that relationship with, I, I don't know how you could make it through. So let's let's quickly go to this little quick segment. I uh, let's qu- let's skip county council. You did uh, yeoman's work on county council. You really did. And I, you know, I I, I, I watched that myself. And you were a mouthpiece. Did you ever serve as chairman? I believe you. Did you ever serve as chairman? No, they, they, yeah. I, I considered it a couple of times, but uh-huh. I'll tell you, when, when when Daddy died, Daddy died after I got elected and before I got sworn in. Oh gosh, I got mm-hmm. elected in November of '04. Daddy died mm-hmm. in November of '04. Daddy died the day before Thanksgiving, yeah. so my dad saw me beat Tom Smith, right, and didn't see me get sworn in. Not at all. So so I was focused on that business. Yeah, and and, and I'm man enough to say this. I, I busted my ass to be as good a daddy as I know how to be. But for a couple of years after my father died, I probably got too consumed with that business. Yeah. The, 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 the man that's going to be there forever and get us out of the bog whenever we get in the bog, he ain't there no more. Right. So, so, so I really, and, 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 and I've told my wife this recently that, you know, I mean, I, I know how hard I tried, but for a couple of three years there, I, I just really honed in on that business, and I, my brother, we we've talked a lot about that. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not saying I made a bad decision, a good decision, but but when when they came to me and asked me about being chairman of county council, I I was I was in the in the midst of my father passing away. We had 100 employees, big business, and I, I got to tend to that. County council don't pay my bills, right? You know that trail body manufacturing did. Yeah, well, you know, it, so I want to get straight to the lieutenant governor, and, and let me preface by saying this. I remember somebody bringing you to uh, Marion when I was mayor, and we sat down and talked. And I said, like, "Golly, this guy's impressive. He, he's one of us." But 
how you ever wrapped your arms around an entire state is mind boggling to me. I mean, uh, it was just such a challenge to bring on, but you, but you, but you did it. Uh, but let's get right past that. That in itself was just a fun. Yeah, how many lieutenant governors have we had around here? I don't know. I think I was number 40, 80. I but I mean around these parts. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, mean, well, that, that well, had, I mean, David won the governorship, and I yeah. think other than David, I'm the only other right. person from the PD to win a statewide race. <laughs> it's a heavy lift. So phenomenal. I mean, it's, right. a, it's a heavy yeah. lift coming from the PD and winning statewide. David can tell you that, yeah. and I can tell you that. So let's move past that because, you know, there was a it was a rocky road at the end. And, and had that not happened, good Lord, you— you, you, you might have been Trump today. I, I don't know. I mean, that's just how talented I, I think you are. <laughs> you might have kind. But look, I reflected back, and, and prior to this, you know, I was looking over some articles. I remember when all that went down, right? But I guess uh, one of the articles I read, and I saw, and, and all that was stacked against you, and, and what could have happened, should the good Lord not have shown some favor. But I remember uh, one picture where you were embraced with your sweet, beautiful wife, and I got to thinking, you know, I've been through a few things, too, in politics, and I just can't imagine going through that, Ken. Just reflect on a moment well, I mean, how dark that well, was. But, but, but I, I, yeah, it, it wasn't a lot of fun. <laughs> it wasn't a lot of fun at all. But, but I, I want to go back because I, I think it's important. Dr. Eddie Floyd called me one day, and you know Dr. Eddie. I mean, he'd be a political godfather, and he's a – my father died – and and I I started showing up. At, I mean, I'd go to Dr. Eddie when I'd have questions. I mean, I didn't have that that fatherly influence, but Dr. Eddie and I developed a political friendship, and and I respected him a lot. And Dr. Eddie called me one day, and I was at work, and he said, "What you doing?" I said, "I'm working." He said, "When well, you get a minute ride by the hospital, I want to talk with you." And I did. I'm at a road by there. I'm on county council, so so you know he chairs the Bruce Lee Foundation. We're always working on on things together. So I assumed. Then I'm going to see Dr. Eddie about, you know, something to do with the Bruce Lee Foundation and, and county council. And I sat down in his office, and he said, Andre Bauer came to see me. And I said, okay. He said, Andre's going to run for governor. I said, okay. He said, I want you to think about something. What? I want you to think about running for lieutenant governor. That's when it was separate. It didn't run Yeah, we, did, we didn't run together. I mean, Nikki and I ran separate to one another. Nikki ran, and I ran, and, and now it is. You're right. It's a ticket. And I was there when the Senate voted on the bill to— and, and I was supportive of that. I mean, I felt the governor, lieutenant governor should be kind of a team. Um, I mean, you had the, the governor doing his thing, lieutenant. Anyway, um, I told Dr. Eddie, I said, man, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not scared of a giant, but I don't know if I want to fight one that big. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, just give me your word that you'll go see these people. And he gave me a list. And it would have been— a compliment to start with. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I was humbled. I mean, because his opinion mattered a lot to me. And, and when he convinced me to do that, he gave me a list and told me to go see. And it would have been Barry Wynn and Gail Everett and Bob Royal and Joe Edens and all these these folks that he interacted with and david wilkins i mean you know it's the who's who with the grand old of the grand old party in south carolina and i went around and um and i got pretty good feedback and i went back to dr eddie and i said hey i i, I may do this i mean I, you know i may i may consider doing this and we 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 filed we announced we ran um excuse my french we didn't know our ass from third base to begin with uh, i ran the campaign out of my truck I mean, be an entrepreneur and a business guy. I mean, I, I would go to an event, give a speech, and I would tell I'd, I'd have one of my sons with me, and I'd say, "Hey, take the truck and those thirty signs in the back, put them all out, and if you put them somewhere they're not supposed to be, they'll take them up. <laughs> but put them in the most high visibility area." So I'm giving a speech. He's out there, and, and I mean, we kind of ran by the seat of our by the seat of our pants. Well, Ronnie, I I never asked anybody for money. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. I mean, you, you, you know where I come from now. I mean, the, the man that raised me said, you work for what you get. You pull yourself up by your booster. You don't call complete strangers and ask them for $3,500. Who do you think you are? So, so it got to the first quarter reporting or the first reporting period, and I hadn't raised any money. And I'd lied to my fundraiser. I mean, I said, yeah, I called these 20 people. I ain't called a damn soul. I didn't call anybody. I mean, I was scared to call them. I didn't know what to tell Joe Edens and Bob Royal and Barry Wynn. I mean, I knew Dr. Eddie well enough to ask him. But um, but I called my banker, and I said, hey, man, how much money did I have in that money market? He told me. And um, and I said, well, look, I, I, I'm coming to get some of that, and I'm going to give it to my friends and get them to give it back to my campaign. Mm -hmm. Now, I can give myself money. Mm -hmm. But I got to do it the way the Ethics Commission says you got to do it. And I didn't do it that way. And I've never blamed anybody else for that. I, I've never tried to say, well, I mean, you know, uh, they did me this way and they didn't. Do of course I've thought of some but of that. What, but what an admirable, I mean, you know, well, I mean, you it, look it, at that. What kind of an admirable way? Let me say this. Going back to Dr. Eddie, 
I went to see him one day when it all went south. And I said, Dr. Floyd, they've done this to me, and they've let this person who did this and this person. He said, stop right there. I, 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 you're better than that. Let, let's, mm -hmm. let's own it. Keep your head down. Go to work. This community will forgive you. And he said something I'll never forget. Those that, that hadn't forgiven you ain't going to ever forgive you. Mm -hmm. Those that, that will have already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Concentrate on those that have already forgiven you. Try to make right by them. Go to work. Build you, build you a life on this side of getting thrown out of, out of office. And um, and and I'll tell you, the one thing that I'm most proud of is I owned every second of it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll put something on Twitter or Facebook now, and there's always these antagonists out there that'll say, "Yeah, that's from the guy who had 23 ethics violations and you know seven counts of misspending campaign fund." And I, I of course, I mean, I, I'm competitive like you are, and I want to fire back and say, "You know, count son of a gun, do you not?" Know, but I, you, you, I, I made a big mistake. Well, the judge, I saw where he dressed you down, and to your credit, you did exactly what you just said. You owned every bit of well, it. Well, I mean, I, and I, I apologized to everybody. Well, Rodney, I told him in the courtroom, I said, Your Honor, I'd love to tell you I come from a broken home. Uh -huh. I'd love to tell you that I don't know right from wrong. I'd love to tell you that, 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 that I had no positive influence, but that'd be the biggest lie I could tell you. Mm -hmm. I have been blessed. The majority of influences in my life have been right. I am. I, I clearly know that I did wrong, and, and I, as much as I'd love to tell you that I come from a place where right and wrong were so ambiguous and confusing, that would be a lie. And I ain't gonna lie to a judge. So, so, so yes, I did wrong, and I'm here to take my punishment, and I'm here to move along. They felt you were genuine because they showed mercy. Let me ask you this, because this is this is what crosses my mind, and I'll tell you, it, 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 if for no other reason, my relationship with the Lord. But I never want to let my son down. How did how did you explain that to your children? I, I mean, they already knew sure. that my daddy's well, a, I mean, and, and, my daddy's a a, a, a class act. Well, he told us right from wrong, but that still had to be tough. It was important to me for you and everybody to know that no public money was misspent. Mm -hmm. Every dollar that was misspent, misallocated, misaccounted for was my money. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I slept at night. I've mm -hmm. never had any trouble sleeping. I didn't take taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. I didn't misspend money that was given to me. The, every penny that, that I was accused of misspending, what was it was it was my money. Mm -hmm. uh, if I ran for office again, the bumper sticker say still my money. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> it was my money then; it's still my money now. But you can't do it that way. Yeah. And and, and no matter how you run your small business, because you know small business men and women are always juggling. Right. You're moving things. I mean, what's the old saying? Robbing from Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. So you're always kind of juggling things around and, and moving things around. But but I decided. That, that there was no need in me trying to explain it. it. But it was important to me for my family and my friends to know yeah. that I didn't misspend taxpayer dollars. I didn't misspend money that was given to my campaign. Every single red cent that I got accused of misspending came out of my pocket. I, I, for no other reason, I wish this would go viral for everybody to hear that because, you know, People take liberties with, with with all kind of things. But I was wrong. That's such a strong. But but I was wrong. Yeah, but what such a strong statement. But but there. but I want to reiterate. Look yeah. at the I was wrong. You can't do it that way, and I did it anyway. I ain't justifying it neither. Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty damn smart the way I did it. But you can't do it. That, you can't do it. You can't do it that way. There, there's our character showing up well, once again. It, it is what it is. Hey, as we close out, we're gonna end on a high note. You've been through so much, and and and, and, and I look at it now and. Uh, so I turn uh, to the radio every morning as I commute, and sometimes it's so daggum good that I'll switch to my phone when I'm at work, and that's 95.3. That's flattering. Appreciate you that. You and the Royal Reb have done something that, you know, I'd like, uh, you know, She Magazine was kind of my claim to fame, and it had a lot of success. This, uh, what you guys have achieved in terms of listenership, in terms of people, hold, I, you know, I, I call it ARDS, Army and and Baker's buddies, uh, you're you're a such duo. Uh, you work so well together. But look, I've never seen an audience a mass like this. And to hang on every word you say, uh, you get phone calls, which to me is a great gauge. You get constant phone calls on that show, and you've you guys have moved the needle in this thing. Uh, they've they've grown to love you. They've grown to trust you, and it's a phenomenon I, I, all the time uh, because people know that. We've got somewhat of a friendship. They say, well, you've seen your buddy Ken lately. You know, things like that. But, I mean, how, how did this happen? Surely when y'all started, you said, look, we, we've got something pretty good here. 
did you ever think it reach where you're at well, now? Well, Rodney, I'd been in business my entire life, and when you're called a rascal and a scandal and no good, I mean, I told you on the elevator coming up here that, I mean, I, I, I don't think I'm no count, no good, and a crook, and a chief. I mean, I, I'm flawed. I'm deeply flawed, and I got a lot of stuff that I need to work on, but I knew in my heart th that I was not a crook, and I didn't steal money. I mean, that, that's what, I mean, I, 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 I knew better than that. So, so when I came back home, I mean, my reputation was in tatters, and I, I needed to restore that. And I made the loop, and I went and talked to people that I cared about, and I thought cared about me, and and I had to find something to do. You know, I, I'd sold my part of the truck body business, so I'm kind of um, I'm, I'm a free agent, so to speak. I had a little bit of money, and I, and I had some interest in things that were were doing okay, but but I needed to go to work, and um. And I, and I started thinking about what I could do and what I couldn't do. We did a project downtown. Uh, you know that. I mean, I, I'm a partner owner in town hall, the restaurant, the dispensary, and, yeah, and some of that property man. there. Um, I, I'll call a name Dale Barth and Ken Jackson, are partners of mine, and some other things that we do. We do some development property together, and we do some kind of other things. Um, but but I needed I needed to do something in business. I mean, I needed to know that, hey, because I'm nervous. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm young. I need money. I need income. I need to go to work. And Dave Baker and Harold Miller had a their banker. Harold's banker was my banker. And I mean, I, Rob Berger, BB and T. Rob called me one day and said, "Hey, what you thinking about doing?" I said, "Well, I'm doing these. I mean, I, I feel pretty good about these two things I'm in the middle of, and I got some partners, and and I feel everything's uh, going to be okay." He said, "Harold Miller needs a guy to do his morning show." And I said, well, Harold's got Tom Connor doing that morning show. He said, yeah, but Tom's getting a little older. His health isn't the best in the world. He kind of wants to move on. And 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 I told Harold, I think you'd be perfect. And I said, Rob, I don't have any damn training at radio, man. I mean, listen to me. I'm too ain't y'all for formal radio. And I mean, you know, so, so anyway. Well, they didn't know that. The minute you get behind that mic, there's well, a Well, and a, there's I didn't know that. I mean, I, you did know, you not know that? I didn't, I didn't know, know that. that. I mean, look, here's what I look at the radio show. I was pretty good at running for office. Mm -hmm. I mean, I put my name on a ballot eight times. I've never lost. I've never been the most credentialed candidate. I don't think I've ever been the smartest candidate. Mm -hmm. I, I think in one or two races, I might have been the best funded candidate. My money. Um, <laughs> spend it like I want to. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but. But but I always if I can get on that radio, I'm running a campaign every morning. I mean I thought I'd be running a one hour and one market campaign. Mm -hmm. A listener is a voter. Mm -hmm. I mean I was pretty good at getting people to vote for me. Can I get people to listen to me? Mm -hmm. So so our our mutual friend Rob Berger arranged a meeting, and Harold Miller, Dave Baker, and I met at Groucho Trip Kelly Groucho mm -hmm. right around the corner here, and um and they they you know hey man we we got this idea we got a chance to get Russell Limbaugh in the noon slot. We want to build a radio show around Limbaugh. He was the, you know, the big guy. I mean, you know, he's the, he's the most important radio figure in the history of of radio. You could argue, and we need a local morning show. Well, you you talked about the dark days of, of being lieutenant governor. I'd been to the paper a bunch, and it, it wasn't me winning the lottery. You know what I mean? It wasn't me being Rotarian of the Year or, or, or Lions Club Member of the Year. It's getting my ass handed to me by by the media, and I deserved it. I mean, I, I deserved all that negative coverage. And I remember telling Harold and uh, and Dave Baker, I said, "Look, I ain't gonna quit going to church, but I, I I'm gonna sit in the back for a while. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna sit on the front row." And they persisted, and Rob persisted, and and one of the financial partners in Miller Communications was Frank Avant. A Pepsi, and we got Pepsi on the list here, and um, and he was a dear friend to me, and somebody I just hold in the highest regard imaginable, one of the most generous and giving men I've ever known in my life. And I went out to Mr. Avant because I knew he had an interest in that station. I said, Mr. Avant, Harold Miller and Dave Baker have asked me about hosting a radio show, and I know you've got something to do with this network, and I got some fleas, and and I don't I don't want I don't want to bring them to you. I mean, you 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 have you you have impeccable integrity. And, and you are a man that the community admires, and I don't want to associate with you. And he's told me, and I'll never forget, he said, I'm good with it. You, i got to stop right there. When you said you got fleas, you fully understand that's the people that God uses, right? Those that have fleas. Well, I'm tired that's of God using me. I wish God gave me, I wish God gave me a year or two off. Put a collar on. Well, I mean, no, no I, you and I have had this conversation a hundred times. America has been conditioned to conform. Mm -hmm. 
and masculinity and testosterone are frowned upon. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you guys, if it weren't for masculinity, testosterone, and, and, and aggressive thinking, we'd be bowing to a damn king. Yeah. And, and I, I'm worried about our nation and so many men mm. are being conditioned to conform. I'm afraid mm. to step out. I'm afraid you're to be wrong. bold. I'm afraid to do. And I'm going to tell you, Rodney, when mm -hmm. you step out, you're going to get fleas. Mm -hmm. You're going to get attacked. You're, you're going to get, uh, you know, some things are going to be fair. Some things aren't going to be fair. But but I, I went back and met with Dave and Harold, and we cut a deal. And, um, and out of that came a one-hour radio show. And Baker can vouch for this. I basically took the old paper and kind of read some of the articles. Mm -hmm. And we started getting a guest or two, school districts. Now, now, now Tom said, I'm going to do a radio show that my mom can sit beside me and not be ashamed her son's doing. Mm -hmm. My mom was a Proverbs lady. I ain't sure my mom would approve of everything I say on the radio. Mm -hmm. Hell, I'm sure she wouldn't approve mm -hmm. of everything I say on the radio. Some things I say ain't sure my dad mm -hmm. uh, would approve. But, but we, Dave and I, and Harold... And now the community broadcast ownership, Jim Levin and Bruce Mittman have been nothing, nothing but supportive of what we do here. Um, it went from one hour in one market, two hours in one market, three hours in one market, four hours in three markets. We cover 25, 30 percent of the state. Um, you talked about Luton. When, when I had an office with, you know, about eight things of mold, rounds of mold, what am I trying to say? Layers of molding. Mm -hmm. I had a couch in the corner that belonged to John C. Calhoun. Mm -hmm. I never took a nap on that couch because I'm scared of Calhoun. He looked like Dracula <laughs> in that picture behind uh, where I presided in the Senate. But, um, but, but the perception of power went along with that office. Mm -hmm. But that radio is powerful. Oh, I mean, no. it, it, it's a, and, 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 and I think Baker will vouch for this. As good as we think we are, Trump made it good. I mean, yeah. Trump made it better. No, uh, no, question. He, no question. You talked about, about Ric Flair. Yeah. I mean, I, I met Trump. And my wife and I went to an event. We met Trump kind of behind the scenes. We had backstage passes yeah. to a Donald Trump, <laughs> I wouldn't say rally, but it's a concert. Uh, it, it's, it's almost like when you go to a Trump rally, it's like the SEC football meets NASCAR meets a wrestling match. <laughs> And he was the most cordial and normal person you could imagine, mm -hmm. like you talked about flaring the car. Mm -hmm. And when they swung those doors open, I mean, it was no holes barred. It, it, it was having at it. So, yeah, I mean, the radio has impacted our community. And, and we moved the meter on some things. But, but I don't want to understate, as good as we think we are at it, mm -hmm. Donald Trump made it no a question, lot easier. But, but I tell you, what, you, you you're underestimating yourself because I, I talked to the public out there and uh, I maintain that uh, once discovered, uh, you as the mouthpiece, and then Dave, y'all just got incredible chemistry. You guys could be national. Yeah, I, I, I enjoy you more than I do Sean Hannity. That's very, very, very kind I mean of you. That. And listen, uh, how many times have you? Who, who? How many times has folks interviewed the president? You've done it how many times? Twice. Twice. And last time, uh, I've heard it both times. And the last time. Uh, there was no hint of nervousness. You, you. It was like he was just a regular guest, and it worked so well. There was no intimidation there. But, but, but I think, and I, I mean, if Dave were here, I think I mean, I'm speaking for, for. I mean, I'm answering the question, but I'm answering it for he and I because we talked a lot mm -hmm. about this. The, the one pledge we made to one another, we're gonna keep it real. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be authentic. Right. I went to Greenville when I ran for lieutenant governor and read a speech. You're talking about your wife knows better than anybody. I read a speech, and we got in the car to go home. And I mean, I talked about the Fed and quantitative easing, and you know the the the, the overnight lending rate. And I mean, I, I mean, I'm talking to a bunch of sophisticated people, and I got to be sophisticated, putting my Brooks Brothers suit on, you know. And I and I walk, and we get in the car to go home. My wife says, "What in the world was that?" She said, "You don't <laughs> read to that? people. You talk to people." You don't read. You are not any good at reading to people. You are much better talking to people. Well, for four hours a morning, I get to basically, in the most cathartic way imaginable, you know, have self therapy. I mean, I care about the country. I care about the body politic. I think I have a good understanding, and I think you'll give me that. Yeah, I mean, as crazy yes, as I am sir. about some other things, I'm I mean, I study it. I, I try to understand it. I try to make heads or tails of it. Um, I mean, I've got some real strong, aggressive beliefs, and I don't apologize for having those. But, um, you know, the one thing that, that, that Dave and I kept talking about is, okay, we're in a controversial genre of radio. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no doubt that conservative talk radio is aggressive in nature. Ronnie, any time you give a phone number and tell however many people listening, whatever you think, call in and tell yeah, me. Yeah, you're just... asking for trouble. But, I mean, you're, you're, but you're asking for conflict. And I think about these sponsors. Uh -huh. You know, when I think about they're the lifeblood of our business. I mean, if they don't sponsor, we ain't on the air. 
I mean, they pay the bill. So I always try to think about t- t- saying something that I believe to be true in concert and in balance with what the sponsors and their reputation uh, and, and how they've associated and partnered yeah. with our business. Yeah. Ken, so often, you know, when, you know, when we have lunch or coffee together and then I listen to radio, I said, who, who is that guy? <laughs> it just turns on, man. And I think it's a, well, my, my, a my wife, thing. My, and, and I, and I'll say my wife, Q, we got a place in North Litchfield and we love to go. Yeah, and she, that's where I'm, let, let's end on okay, this. Okay. How do you, how do you unwind? I, I think I know, cause I know you enjoy the beach, but just talk a moment a bit about how Ken Ard unwinds the character. I, I like a fire. <laughs> I like a fur. Uh, yeah, a I, fur. I, I, so, so, most nights a little bit of Jefferson's Ocean. Some <laughs> nights a bunch of Jefferson's Ocean, and I and I like classic rock, and I like old outlaw country, uh-huh. and I'll take my Bluetooth. My wife says we go to North Litchfield so I can hide, and I I, I don't think that's true. But but um, I mean I, you know I, I want to. I take a lot of air out the room, and I know I do. I mean, I I, I demand a lot of attention. It's my personality. I, I hope I'm not arrogant about it, but, I mean, it's just my nature. I got a lot to say. I, you know, I don't shy away from conflict or controversy. My wife has been my soulmate, and she's always allowed me to take most of the air out the room, and I want to spend the rest of my life making sure she gets her share. I mean, that, that, in essence, that's what I – I want to devote my life – to, to, to making sure that it ain't about me. Wow. It, it's about others. I, and, and that's hard. I mean, that's hard for somebody like me. Because yeah. I, I, don't, I don't say I love the attention, but I sure don't shy away from it. I mean, I always find myself in the middle of stuff. You know, some, somebody, I mean, you, you're talking about thinking about doing something. So you call me one day, and I, I mean, I ain't the kind to of say, no, Rodney, I don't want to do that. I mean, I don't want to help you. Yeah. You're my buddy. I want to help you. I want to always help my friends. I don't ever want to say no to a friend. Yeah. If you need something, damn it, I want to figure out a way to, to try and help him. But, but my wife has been on a journey largely dominated by me mm-hmm. and my interest in what I want and what I need and what I think. And, and I'm 60 now, and I don't know how many more years the good Lord gives me, but I want to make a lot of it about her. I think that's fantastic, and I think she's probably very deserving of that, and, and, and that's a great way to end, Ken. As we break this, this thing down, I don't think there's no question that today we have met one more character in Mr. Ken Art. I appreciate the opportunity of being here your with friend. you today. Yeah, you, I, You're a good friend, and, and I want to look at the camera. Too. I mean, I, look, you folks have been so kind and gracious, and I, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, when, when, when I stumbled and fell – you could have done one or two things. You could have stoned me to death, and, and I probably deserve some of that. But you didn't. Uh, you, you, you decided there was enough for me to salvage. And and this is home. I love the PD. I love South Carolina. And um, and you folks have just been unbelievably gracious and supportive. And I thank you. <laughs>